Hello again and welcome in the third part of this MOOC dedicated to oil refining. This part is widely dedicated to kerosene and diesel fuel production. Let's start with the kerosene. As for the gasoline, let's focus on the main properties imposed by aircraft manufacturers to the refiner. There are three main properties for jet fuels. The first one of these properties is the freezing point. In fact, when an aircraft is in the air, the outside temperature can be very low. But even in these conditions of extreme low temperatures, the kerosene has to remain perfectly fluid. In other words, molecules shall not begin to solidify or to crystallize. The regulation imposes to refiner that the temperature at which molecules can start crystallizing shall be below minus 47 degrees. The second main property is the content in sulfur. For environmental reasons, the international standards imposes the sulfur content not to exceed 3000 ppm. Furthermore, regulations also imposes the mercaptan sulfur to be below 30 ppm. This is to prevent the kerosene to have a very bad smell. If we make a zoom on the straight run kerosene of several crudes, we see that the freezing point is always lower than minus 47 degrees. Thus, no difficulties in reaching this objective. For the total sulfur, kerosene cut is generally compatible with the total sulfur constraint of 3000 ppm. But, on the other hand, for the maximal content in mercaptans, we see that this is not always the case. Then, the main treatment necessary to produce kerosene consists in removing the mercaptan sulfur. To get rid of these mercaptans, we have two options. The first option is radical. The idea is the same as for removing the sulfur in the nap ticket. I mean, using hydrogen. This method has the advantage to remove 100% of the sulfur, whether it is mercaptans or not. It is thus luxurious, but very effective. The drawback of this method is that it requires some hydrogen. The second option, particularly in the case the refinery is short in hydrogen supply, consists in a sweetening process. This reaction consists in letting mercaptans react between themselves to produce disulfides. For sure, we do not change the total sulfur content of the kerosene. We just change the molecular structure of the sulfurated molecules. Clever, isn't it? Then, what about diesel fuel? For diesel fuel, it is simpler because the international authorities impose the sulfur not to exceed 10 ppm, just like the gasoline, and 15 ppm in North America. And whatever the crude oil, straight run diesel always have very high sulfur content compared to the final objective. This time, no option. It will be necessary to use hydrogen. In diesel fuel, the sulfur is present under several forms. Thiophenes, benzothiophenes and dibenzothiophenes. The heavier the molecule, the harder it will be to remove the sulfur. We qualify these heavy molecules as refractory. Generally speaking, in the refinery, we can find a diesel halo treater to remove the sulfur from the diesel fuel with the help of hydrogen. The catalyst is always the same, but the operating conditions are more severe than for a naphtha halo treater. Why? Because molecules are more complex and more difficult to treat. The temperatures can go up to 400 degrees and the pressures can reach 40 to 90 bars. But then, what do we do with the atmospheric residue? This atmospheric residue is used as raw material for fuel oil production, for boats or power plants. Another application is the bitumen production to cover the roads. Here we are. The refiner used the separation and the chemical reaction to transform the crude oil into specific products. Fuels, kerosene, power plant fuels, etc. But remember, 
If we have such a refinery scheme, we are going to produce approximately 5 to 15% of gasoline, 10% of kerosene, and 20 to 25% of diesel fuel. But also 40 to 50% of fuel oil and bitumen, which is much more than what we need. To have an economically viable refinery, it is necessary to produce more gasoline, kerosene, and diesel fuel, and less fuel oil. Then, how can it be done? Well, if you remember, we said that we could not go beyond 380 degrees in the atmospheric distillation because of cracking. Separate the atmospheric residue by distillation seems impossible. Impossible? This word does not belong to the vocabulary of the refiner. The refiner knows he has to make it better. Physics is going to help him. Remember this distillation curve of the crude oil? We recovered the naphtha, the kerosene and the diesel fuel, but we stopped here. As you can see here, the atmospheric residue represents approximately 50% of the crude oil. If we want to go further, it will be necessary to manage to separate the molecules of the atmospheric residue. But how? At this point, you now remember that the boiling point depends upon a parameter, the pressure. Indeed, if we lower the pressure, this curve is going to move down. In fact, if we do the same experiment, I mean heating up the crude oil, it will be much more easier to vaporize the molecules. And in these conditions, I mean 380 degrees, we managed to vaporize molecules which would have boiled at temperature of 500 to 580 degrees C at atmospheric pressure. We are going to reproduce this reduced pressure at industrial scale, which is generally ensured by steam ejectors. We heat up the atmospheric residue to 380 to 400 degrees C under vacuum at about 20 to 100 millimeters of mercury. The atmospheric pressure is about 760 mm of mercury. It represents approximately one-tenth of the atmospheric pressure, or 100 millibars. At this pressure, we recover a new cut, which we call VGO. VGO stands for vacuum gasoil, simply because it was produced in a vacuum column. The bottom of the column is called the VR, for vacuum residue. So, okay, we succeeded in producing a new cut, the video. But then, what to do with that? We will see that later on in the last part of this MOOC. Do not forget to fill the quiz on refiningisexciting.com to test your knowledges. Thank you very much for your attention and see you soon in the last part.